to Sunday school, we'll say adios. They really mean that. Go with God. Come back to us in a little while. Tell us what you learned. Let's uh, pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we have together. That, Lord, that you bless us with your presence. Lord, you allow us, you draw us to yourself to bow before you and worship you. And Father, we long to give you honor and praise and glory. Lord, we long to be faithful, uh, sons and daughters, Lord, along that road, Lord, which you called us to walk faithful to you, Father. And I just pray your blessing on your word. You will enable us to speak and to hear and to take to heart your, your word that you want to say to us this morning. Well, Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, just by way of a brief introduction, I just want to say that we, all, we always do well to remember and meditate on all that Christ has done for us. And indeed, that's what we have been doing. But not only to, to remember and to think, but also to, to marvel, to appreciate, and to, to have hearts overflowing with thankfulness and praise for all that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. One good way we can do that is to turn to Romans chapter 5. This is not really a text I'm taking for this morning's message, but it does allow us to, to pause and to think about what the Lord Jesus has done for us. We're just going to read chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And the verses we do well to meditate upon and to read again and again. But the Apostle writes, Therefore, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. How much there is in just a few verses to cause us to remember again and to think deeply about what Christ has done for us. Here in those few verses, we, we have this great theme of Paul, uh, with justification by faith. We are justified by faith, therefore we have what? Peace with God. That beautiful word, shalom, peace. We have peace with God. Not only that, we have access to, to the very presence of God or, or introduction as, as if Jesus is bringing us into the very presence of God, our Father. We have access. And I'm just, just thinking of there where we were breaking the bread and taking of the cup. I was just thinking of that verse that when Jesus died on the cross, what does it say? It says the veil in the temple was torn from the top to about halfway down, or maybe a little bit more than half. Halfway down. Is that what it says? No. It was torn from the top to the bottom. And through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, we now are able to enter in. What a marvel. We're able to come into the very presence of God and stand before him with his favor upon us, with his grace lavished upon us. And the first verse there says that we have this access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. This is we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So because of Jesus, it's, it's through Him and in Him, we have this boldness. Uh, we have confident access to the Father because we have found favor in His presence. We stand in grace and by grace. And we can approach the throne of grace boldly. That's exactly what Moses did. Have a look back in uh, Exodus chapter 33, verse 13. Moses had, had, had been so close to the Lord by this time that he, he had a, a, this holy boldness to come and speak to the Lord 
as we see that he does here in Exodus chapter 33. Let me just read a few verses. Starting from verse 12, 12 and 13. Exodus 33, 12 and 13. Then Moses said to the Lord, So you say to me, Bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, so that I might find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. So with a, with a holy boldness, Moses is able to come and speak to the Lord in this way. And, and he says, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways that I may know you, and that I might find favor in your sight. I think there's a parallel passage to what Paul's saying in, in, in Romans 5 there. We have access into the very uh, presence of God. Into this grace in which we now stand. That's the favor of God. And so we find ourselves by grace in this position. We find ourselves forgiven. Justified. Accepted. Loved redeemed, adopted into God's family, his, his, his children. And all of this, we stand in this. We stand because of what Jesus accomplished for us through his death on the cross. So there we are in, that, in such a position, such a, through the, the work of such a great Savior, so great a salvation it is. So there we are, there we're standing in the very presence of God. And so what do we do now? You might say, what now? We walk. We walk. But then what? We keep walking. And then? That's right, we keep walking. We keep walking. That's my simple message this morning. We walk. Now walking is, is actually something I, I like to do. Do we have that photograph by any chance? Yes. Um, I, 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 love, I love walking. You know. Especially along a road like that. That's, that's where I like to walk. That was uh, taken up uh, in the Blue Mountains. And um, it's, just, it's just a road that you can walk on. And notice there's a little turn in the upper ways and you want to yes sir you'll get lost you get lost well you, you stick to the path and you'll be right <laughs> but as, as, the, as the road bend, turns you, you're, you're curious you want to know what's what's around the next corner so you keep walking and you discover some new things and and you're just listening to the sounds all sounds all around you and then the road winds and there's another turn and uh, it's like life you don't know what's going to be around that next uh, bend in the road but uh uh, that's that, that's a road I like to walk upon. So thank you for that. We can put that down now. Well, walking is a good thing to do, but but more importantly for our message this morning, walking is is a metaphor for life, for for living, living life. It is for for our conduct, if you like, a lifestyle, and the choices that we make. And the Bible uses walking in this figurative sense uh, over and over again. Many, many references we could turn to where it speaks of walking in a figurative sense. Uh, for example, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 says, says these words, very important words, listen. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. So walk in Him. There's a continuation, walking in Him, walking with Him, walking before Him. Now John Bunyan begins his great classic work, Pilgrim's Progress, with these words. He says, As I walk through the wilderness of this world, and if you read the book, the person, the main character, whose name is Christian, walks 
He walks the road. In fact, it, the whole title of the book really is, is Pil The Pilgrim's Progress from This World to That Which Is to Come. And in the book, he walks. He walks along roads. And um, so Christian's walking. He walks uphill. He walks downhill. He walks winding roads, narrow roads, often very difficult roads. And many things happen to him along the way. Along the way, he's, he encounters others. He's able to help others, and he's able to receive help from others along the way. There are many tests. There are many trials. There are great difficulties. But you know, there's also refreshment for him. And there's comfort for him. And so, so it is for us. There will be trials. There will be testings. And, and there will be hardships. And there will be difficulties. And there will be times of refreshment and, co and great comfort. And there will be times when the Lord will just stand right next to you. As if he's standing right in front of you. And he's just saying, I love you. And he will be showing you how great his love and his care and his concern is for you as you walk this road with him. Now, if I was an artist, I would draw a picture for you. I'm, I'm not an artist, but uh, if I could, I would draw a picture something like this. We have a pilgrim and who, having heard the gospel, re responds in faith. He believes the word, the word of the gospel. And so he enters through, as he's instructed, through the narrow gate. And he, he is free. He, he passes through the gate and in a big, a heavy load, the burden of sin, which he's been carrying, falls. Falls from his shoulders. And he, and he enters through the narrow gate and he's free. He has passed from darkness to light. He's saved. He, and he enters through into a, into a broad place. Now, just I would picture the, the man walking through the gate. And a broad field is in front of him. And that field, I would call the, the favor of God, the grace of God. He, he enters into that place where he stands in a right relationship with God, in God's favor, God's grace, being lavished upon him. But this is not the end. No, this is just the beginning. Because I'll also picture, as he goes through the narrow gate, into this broad field, there before him is a road. A road stretching out before him that our pilgrim must walk along. A path from this world to that which is to come as Bunyan says in the Pilgrim's Progress. Now in this image of walking, I just, could, I just had a look at a dictionary of, of biblical imagery. And this, uh, I found this quote. We have here a concrete, everyday practice which becomes a window on divine realities. Now what is more everyday than walking? It's something we do every single day. And it's, and it's just a, it's a movement. God has given us His ability to walk, and so we do. We walk. But this concrete, everyday practice becomes a window on divine realities. And to me, it's, it's a simple, yet a striking image. But walking is moving. It's progress in a, in a certain direction, in a chosen direction, along a road, a path, or if you like, a way, a way. Now, the Bible uses this image many times. Let me just give you a few examples. The, we are to walk in all God's ways. We are to walk in the fear of the Lord. We are to walk in the light of His presence. The book of Proverbs has this. We are to walk in the ways of good people. We are to walk in the way of righteousness, in the way of understanding, in the way of truth. Our walk is to be blameless, we are to walk in newness of life. I love that expression. Walk in newness of life. We are to walk in love. We are to walk in faith and by faith. The road we walk is illumined by the Word of God. And we are strengthened by the presence of God. And we look to the promises of God, the fulfillment of every promise that He has made. And it is by grace that we walk. Every step of the way is by grace. Trusting in God. For it is God who has enabled us to walk. And He has given us the road, the path upon which to walk. 
The psalmist puts it this way, Thou hast shown me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I just want to make a couple points about this walking, this path of life that stretches out in front of each one of us. So <laughs> think in your minds, just have a mental picture in your minds of a man of faith or a woman of faith walking along a road. Are you picturing that? Or think, think it's yourself. Imagine it's you yourself walking along the path of life. Now what is behind you? Well, it's where you've come from. What is before you? It's where you're going. Okay? This is a very simple message this morning. You're walking on this road. Behind you is where you've come from. Ahead of you is where you're going. Now I want to say this, that you must keep your eyes on where you're going. You must keep your eyes on where you are going. Uh, the book of Proverbs in chapter 4 says, that, says something like this. It says this, and I believe this is so. Uh, it's talking about this walk along the path in this way. Proverbs chapter 4. Let your eyes look directly ahead of you, and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. That's Proverbs chapter 4, verses uh, 23 to 27. The very next chapter of Proverbs uh, chapter 5, it speaks about the adulterous woman. And it says that she does not ponder the path of her feet. So she's walking, but she's not giving a thought to where it is, where she's heading to. Ponder the path of your feet. Let your eyes look straight ahead of you. But, there's a strong tendency to look back. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about that we are not to remember where we've come from. We, we are to remember that we have been cleansed and we've been forgiven of our past sins. We, we do need to look back in that way to remember. I mean, Paul always remembered that formerly he was a persecutor of the church. It's something he never forgot. He, he remembered that. But, and, and of course, we, we in, in looking back, we, we, we look back to remember the goodness of God in our lives and the faithfulness of God, how he has brought us and carried us along the way. But, there's a tendency to look back in the sense of, of a longing for something that was in the past. Look back longingly. You know, there's a verse uh, in Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 10, which says this. Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask about this. You know, and, and that's, that's true, isn't it, that people talk about the good old days. Sometimes you'll find in, in different... Uh, sites or blogs, uh, you'll find people who are very old, maybe my age or, or even older. Uh, yes, they're actually more people older than me. I know, I know it's hard to believe to accept it, and I'm still living. Um, but sometimes people older than me will, will draw people's attention to the way things were. And life was like this, and we had that, and we did this, we did the other thing. And, and they're, they're looking back and they're being nostalgic. Looking back to where, to those good old days. And there's a, there's a longing to want to go back to a simpler life. And we didn't have this, we didn't have that, and life was so much better. Well, let's read that verse again. Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. We're not, we're not to look back in this longing way. But there's a tendency to do just that. Look back longingly, nostalgically, wanting to return to a particular time and place in the past. 
especially when the road we're walking on presently is very rough, when it's a rough and a difficult road. Then we really would think back to some previous time when things were better, when things were maybe easier. And we want to more pleasant, more comfortable, whatever the case is, and we want to go back to that place. Now we read that that's what the children of Israel did. For them, as they journeyed on through the wilderness, the journey was very difficult. And we read that they longed for the sensual delights that they had known in Egypt. Let's have a look. It's over there in Numbers chapter 11. Uh, Numbers chapter 11, verse 5. Now the people had been complaining. They were complaining of the adversity. It says they were complaining in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, he was, his anger was kindled. And when we complain, the Lord hears. And uh, it says a fire broke out. And it consumed some on the outskirts of the camp. Now let's have a look at uh, verse 4. Numbers chapter 11. Verse 4. Uh, the rabble who were among them had greedy desires. And also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. While they're having a good, serious complaint before the Lord. And what, what, what's happening here? Their, their, their minds are going back. They're, they're remembering the way it was. Life is hard. Life is difficult for them now. And very difficult. As they're going through this desert. And so they look back. And they remember only the pleasant things. Oh, what we used to eat back there in Egypt. Fish for free. Onions and garlic and leeks. Well, they just were choosing to ignore one small fact. Is they had those things, but they were also slaves. They were slaves then. They were an oppressed people. They were mistreated. They were in bondage. But as the journey got difficult for them, the, the minds went back to sensual pleasures that they had joined, enjoyed previously. But I just want to say here, later on, much later, you know, because when the Lord brought his people out of Egypt, he said, you will not come back here again. But much later, and in the darkest time, in the days of the prophet Jeremiah, in the, in the overthrow, and the destruction of Jerusalem and its wall being torn down and the temple destroyed and the people taken into captivity. There was a group. There was a group. Do you remember in the days of Jeremiah? What did they do? They went back to Egypt. And it was a disaster. When they did go back, it was an absolute and utter disaster. But I want to say, we too, we are in danger of this very thing. That is, I'm looking back with a desire to return to the former things, the former ways. Looking back to some place or something that, that had brought us pleasure or comfort in the past. And that's just the way I guess our human nature works. If, if we think in our minds of something that was pleasant formerly, or comfortable, or easy, or nice, or whatever, and we think if we could just go back and just recreate that situation, that circumstance as we'll experience the same uh, sensation again. Well, you know, of course, it, this doesn't work. I, I've experienced many times where I've gone back to a place uh, that I had uh, been previously. So I've tried to kind of go back in time and revisit places, only to find that it was so totally different, hardly even recognizable to me. Um, You can't do it. You can't, you, can't, this, you can't go back. And that's my point. There's no going back. There's no going back. There's no looking back. There's no going back. 
You know, when, the, when the, the, the time in the Gospels when the large groups, large numbers of people turn back from following the Lord. And Jesus says to his disciples, do you, do you too also want to go away and leave me? And do you remember Peter's wonderful words? He said, Lord, right. to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And I just love Peter's statement. You don't believe the one who has the words of eternal life. No matter how much the past might be calling you back some form of time. Peter said, no, you have the words of eternal life. So there's no looking back. There's no going back. There's only going forward. This world is not our home. That's the problem of looking back to some, some nice time, some comfortable, some easy time, some pleasant time. We're trying, trying to go back and live in that place as if, it, as if this is, world is our home. Rather than passing through as a pilgrim through this world, through the wilderness of this world. So no matter where you are, where are you on the road, maybe some of you are just beginning that, that walk. Some of you have been walking that road for many, many, many years. Wherever you, where you are on that road, there's only moving forward. It's ever forward, onward. There's no going back, there's no turning to the right, there's no turning to the left. That's what the enemy would try to do. Just divert us off the road this way or this way. Or to try to get us just to stop and stay right where we're at. No, you can't do that. You can't. You know, in, in some some instances, yes. You know, when, when you're like myself, I'm in my, I've been in my profession, teaching profession for about 100 years now. And I'll tell you what, retirement is just looking pretty nice. And I, I'm kind of longing for the days of retirement. Okay, that's fine. There's no retirement from this road. There's no stopping. There's no arriving. Not while we're still uh, drawing the breath within us. Those of you are just starting this road, you may have, you may have uh, at your baptism, I've sung a song something like this. Uh, no turning back, no turning back. Take that to heart. It's not just a nice song. You burn the bridges behind you. There's an only, only going on with the Lord. There's only going forward. Forward and upward. And uh, you might have sung also, uh, the world behind me, the cross before me. Take that to heart. It's not just a song to sing. The world behind me. The cross before me. We've set our heart on pilgrimage. We're walking this road. And there's no going back. And it's a narrow road. How narrow is the road? It's I guess it's it's this narrow. It's just this wide enough for a man to be walking, carrying a cross. A, a cross bearing individual man or woman walking along that road. That's how wide the road is. And of course, nothing will keep us on their road like the big carrying of our cross. As Jesus said, whoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So when we're following after the Lord Jesus, bearing our own cross, each one of us individually, that will keep us on that road, on that narrow road. There's only going forward with the Lord to know him more, to love him more, and to serve him more. There's no retirement, no stopping where we're at. I think of Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica when he said, you, are, you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So he was really commending them. He said, you do love one another. And God is teaching you to love one another. But he didn't say, so just stay, just stay at that level. He said, no, he says, but I want you to excel more and more. Excel still more in love. There's a pressing on. I'm pressing on, as Paul says in, in Philippians. One of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible is Philippians chapter 3. Uh, yeah, Philippians 3. Can we turn there for a moment? Paul, Paul takes up this imagery and he says, I press on, I press on. And, you know, and maybe he's, maybe for Paul, in this uh, imagery here, it's more of a, of a runner than someone walking, because maybe, maybe Paul was more of a runner. No, but, but Paul actually did a lot of walking. 
But, but running, of course, is a good imagery, too. We see in Hebrews, run with patience the race that is set before you. But whether you're running or whether you're walking, you're pressing on. You're pressing on, as Paul says. Uh, chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What wonderful words to, to, to take a hold of. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. It's an upward call. The path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter until the, until the dawning of the day. In this walk, in this heavenly calling, three words, three words to take a hold of. Never give up. Oh, oh, we're all we're all come have those times where we just want to give up. We just want to give up sometimes, and we just sometimes. I remember a friend of mine said, you know, he was going through a hard time, and he just said, "Lord, just take me to heaven." Well, that's in God's time. Never give up. It's always too soon to give up. Can we now look at uh, Hebrews chapter eleven? There's a verse I want to read, a few verses there in chapter 11, which are very relevant to this message. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 13 to 16. It's talking about the, those individuals of faith from the past. And of course we know chapter 11 is that uh, great chapter of the men and women of faith. But let's have a read of these verses. Chapter 11, verse 13. And these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them, and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Uh, verse 14. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of the country from which they went out, they would have had opp opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is really capturing what I want to say. These people, they, they weren't looking back. If, if, they, if their minds and the thoughts were, were from where they had come from, it says that they would have had opportunity to return. But no, it's not where they came from that occupied their thoughts, but where they were going. And the where they were going was not this world, this place, this present time and place. They were looking forward to the heavenly country. And they were, and they were moving towards that, that city which God himself had prepared for them. So look ahead to where you're going, as Paul did, pressing on. He said to himself, forgetting what's behind, I press on to what is, what is ahead. You know, there's a striking verse found in Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 6, verse 23. I was reading this the other day. I won't read the whole verse, but it's just a part of the verse. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 23. Of course, this is Moses. This is Moses talking to the people of the plains of Moab, just before they're ready to be led in under the leadership of Joshua into the Promised Land. At a very significant time in, in, in the whole book of Deuteronomy is that it's Moses uh, speaking to the people of, of, about the, the law of God. And when we come to chapter six, in verse twenty-three, it says these words. These just hit me. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in. Isn't that a wonderful verse? He brought us out so that he may bring us in. Can we just meditate on that for a moment? 
He brought us out that He may bring us in. You see, God brought His people out of Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt. Not to just leave them wandering in the desert to be tested in that wilderness, in that desert, forever. Although probably it's then that sometimes I think like we're going to be in this desert forever. We're never going to get out of here. But, but Moses reminds them, God brought you out so that he'd bring you in. God has a purpose of bringing you out. What's his purpose? To bring you in. I can't, I can't uh, say that enough for my own benefit. God has a purpose in bringing this out. And what is that purpose? To bring us in. He brings us out of slavery uh, to sin. And He brings us into freedom. Forgiveness and freedom. He brings us out of darkness into His marvelous light. He brings us out of this world into His kingdom. He brings us out of our state of restlessness into rest, into peace. And by the way, that's what God said to Moses in that, in that passage we, in, that we read earlier. As Moses is boldly praying before the Lord, uh, to, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways that I may know you. And God says these gracious words to you, I, have, I will do this that you have asked, and I will give you rest. And what a wonderful promise. You know, when you think of all that Moses, Moses had such a heavy burden, and sometimes it just got too much for Moses. You know, even the time there um, when they were wanting to, thinking about Egypt and all they had there, it was a very low time for Moses himself. It was a very low time for him. He, he was in the depths when the people were complaining, give us meat, give us meat. And, and, and Moses cried out to the Lord, Lord, this is just too much for me to bear. I cannot carry these people. And, and again, he cries out to the Lord. But I just mention that because there was that promise where God said, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. So there's movement. There's movement, and from the perspective of the whole Bible, from the perspective of uh, the, from Genesis to Revelation, there's a movement. And from this view, I just want to finish on this. Viewing the whole broad sweep of the Bible from beginning to end, what I see and what I want to stress is a movement from a garden to a city. That's what I see. There's a movement from a garden to a city. To a city. Now some people may say to a city. You know, my, my hippie friends may say, no, 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 you know, that's wrong. We've we, we got to get back to the garden. And um, I grew up in America in the 60s. It was a pretty wild, rebellious time. And it was, uh, it was, it was the hippie time. Long hair and people taking drugs and listening to loud, uh, crazy music. But one of the themes uh, of that era in history was that we, we need to get back to the garden. And of course, in that uh, the lingo of the time, it, it's a get back to nature, you know. And, and it, so it, it would have been no away from the city, back to the garden. But in the, the Bible, no, it's from the garden to the city. And of course, that that that, can, that causes problems because all the connotations that we have about a city are often negative. While we, there might be some good, positive things we say about cities, uh, the places of opportunity, employment, and of course, there's uh, where we're there's excitement. I suppose um, some people couldn't bear to live in, out in the country because it's not the excitement, the bright lights of the city. So some people maybe think of that. But there's many negative connotations about a city. You know, we think of uh, it's noisy, there's pollution, there's crime, there's, there's a rushing back and forth, there's a fast pace in the city. And so what, what, we, what we think about a city sometimes is, can be very negative. But this city, ah, uh, what a city it is. When they talk about the movement from the garden to the city, what a city. Who could describe the city? First of all, this builder and architect is God himself. It's the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the new Jerusalem. 
What a city. Nobody can begin to, to describe the city. We can only read what it says in Scripture. And if you, if you turn to the last, we won't read it now. You can have a look at it later. The last two chapters really describe this heavenly city that God himself had made. Describes it coming down out of heaven and as a bride uh, prepared for her husband. But there's so many wonderful things you'll read there. Uh, first of all, it says that there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. You see, it's, what, I, what I want to finish this message is, is, is an encouraging word. To keep your eyes on where you're going. Because there is an end. There is an end. He brought us out that he may bring us in. Into, into, this, into this heavenly city. Um, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning, or crying, or pain. The first things have passed away. Uh, there won't be any more headaches. Uh, there won't be any more chemo. There, will, there won't be crutches in, in wheelchairs and, and, and pain because, because uh, God will wipe away every tear. And it goes on to talk about the, 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 the wall and the gates of this city and, uh, and all the precious jewels all the precious stones that are the foundation of the city. And the gates themselves are pearls. And, and the streets are gold. And uh, okay, you want to talk about a garden? I'll talk, I'll talk about a garden. There's a river. There's a river flowing through the middle of the city from the very throne of God. It's the river. It's the water of life. And on both sides, there's the tree of life. And there's fruits on that tree. that bears 12 different kinds of, of fruit every single month. And, uh, and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Ah, uh, what a city that is. Keep your eyes on where we're going. There is an end. He brought us out and he may bring us in. And in the midst of all this description of this heavenly city, there's a few times there where it says that God is faithful. In other words, what he's saying here is true. Because God is ever and always faithful to his word and to his promises. But just like every single promise that God made, not, not one falls to the ground. Every one is fulfilled. Every one is brought to pass because it's the Word of God, it's the promise of God. So too with this, as we read in the final two chapters of the Bible, God is faithful and He will do it. Brothers and sisters, let's keep our eyes on where we're, where we're going. And don't look back. There's no going back. There's only pressing on. There's only going forward. Father, we thank You that it's, uh, it's by Your grace that we enter in to your presence, that we stand before you by your grace, with your favor. Lord, what a marvel this is. Lord, that we stand before you forgiven, accepted, loved, as your own people, Father, justified by grace, with peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. And Father, help us, Lord, just to put one foot in front of the other, Lord, to to enter in more and more as we walk along this road into your will for our lives, what you have for us. Lord, as we understand better now, there's only going forward. Lord, uh, so wherever each one of us is at on this road, Lord, help us uh, to, to walk with you, Lord, to lean upon you, Lord, to trust in you, and to keep our eyes, Father, on that, that new heavens and that new earth, on the heavenly Jerusalem, Lord, where you yourself dwell where there's no night, where there's only light, the brightness of your glory. Yes, there's no light there, I pray. In Jesus' name.